Welcome to Lawyers of Tomorrow podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Turner. Today's podcast is about leadership for lawyers, how to develop and retain fiercely loyal talent. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Dov Barron, as today's guest. He is a world authority on purpose-driven and authentic leadership. Dov has been coaching for more than 30 years and speaking, writing, traveling the world, and talking about leadership. Um, he's a headline speaker, um, at global conferences, he talks about leadership, influence, business. And in 2016, Dov was cited by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 speakers for hire. Dov is also a New York Times bestselling author. He's written several books. His most recent ones are Fiercely Loyal, How to Develop, uh, sorry, How High Performing Companies Develop and Retain Top Talent. And there's also a follow up to that, which is Authentic Leadership in Action. Dov writes for um, a number of publications. He's been featured in many magazines, including CNN, CBS, uh, the Small Business Pulse, uh, Yahoo Finance, uh, Boston Globe. We've got CEO World Entrepreneur and many more. Um, now, Dov is also a veteran podcaster, and this is how we became acquainted. Um, Dov has his leadership and loyalty show um, for the Fortune, Fortune 500 executives, which is the number one podcast for Fortune 500 uh, executive. So we are getting a real treat today having Dov on the pod. My understanding, Dov, is that you've gone to over 300 episodes. Is that right? Uh, close to 400 now. Close to 400 episodes. So um, that's how I got to know Dov, via the podcasting community. And I'm privileged to say that Dov has uh, become something of, of, of a mentor for me. And he's given me a lot of guidance as I've tried to get uh, Lawyers of Tomorrow podcast up off the ground. So Dov, thank you very much for that. Um, My pleasure. Thank you. Dov is also uh, posting on YouTube. So Dov has a business called Full Monty Leadership. Great name. I'm going to leave it to Dov to tell you about what that mean, name means later. So there's a lot of meaning behind it. And yes, it does have something to do with that film starring Robert Carlyle. But um, Dov has got uh, a business called Full Monty Leadership. And he posts regularly to YouTube um, on this. So you can check him out on YouTube. Search for Dov Barron and you'll find loads of great content. Um, and it's also through Dov that I was interested to Itzik Amiel. If you if listeners to the pod, you'll remember he did the Networking Secrets. So Itzik did a great podcast and Dov is just another P in that pod. So this is going to be a great pod. And also, what else does Dov do? He posts to uh, Facebook and he has mastered the Facebook algorithm favorite of the 20 minute YouTube uh, uh, Facebook live post. So I haven't yet got into that, but I'm going to watch you a bit more, Dov. <laughs> and then we'll see how that goes. So thank you very much for uh, uh, taking the time out to be on the pod today, Dov. Welcome to Lawyers of Tomorrow. Well, thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm honored to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. And I was really looking forward to it um, since I first met you uh, when you were first starting out. And um, you know, I know you've had it sick on. I know it's going really good. And it's great because what you're doing is, is important. I think it's very important. And I think it's important that people pay attention to the message you're bringing. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I think today's podcast is going to be, I think it's going to be quite challenging for lawyers because some of the <laughs> issues that we're going to get onto, talking about this new business concept of vulnerability and, and so forth, and lawyers having higher purpose. So I'm hoping that this is going to be quite challenging. Um, let's get back to um, how you got into the business, uh, business leadership uh, or general leadership um, uh, a coaching role. So you originally came from Manchester. Um, yeah. I understand that as a kid, you used to go and watch Manchester City. But you're a bit of an apostate now. He doesn't care about football, even though oh. Manchester City are doing so well. But then you, I know you've lived in Australia and you're yeah. currently living in Canada. Is that right? Settled in Canada. Yeah, I was born in, I was born in, in, uh, in Salford, actually, in Manchester. Um, left the UK when I was 21. So I've been gone far longer than I ever lived there. Moved to New Brunswick, Canada, lived there for a year. Then I was in Asia and Indonesia. Then I lived in Australia for many years before I moved to Canada again. Um, so I lived in Canada for one year in between. I spent some time in France and Italy, and then I moved here. So I've been gone a lot longer than I ever lived there. And uh, I've learned and traveled, and it's been wonderful. Yeah, I haven't done so much traveling as you. I've had two periods living abroad, three years in Barcelona and three years in India. And it definitely put, uh, brought something alive in me. Certainly the entrepreneurial 
um, fire was lit when I first moved to Barcelona in 96 to 99, and it hasn't left me since then. So I think uh, foreign travel definitely ignites something. Well, I think, you know, also, you know, it's, it's interesting for me, you know, talking about entrepreneurship and, and entrepreneur mindset. And there are certain countries that are more so than that. I mean, it was part of my pull to North America was the entrepreneurial mindset. I mean, I started my first business when I was 16 um, because I was entrepreneurial and people thought I was mental because, every, you know, you understand. Yeah, and particularly in the world of, of law, you know, you go out, you're trying to find a good practice to get into and join up and hopefully make it to partner. Well, those, that world has changed. It's cha even in the world of law, which tends to be a little bit slower around the entrepreneurial side, but it's changed dramatically. And, and the fact of the matter is, you know, part of what I talk about a lot in, in this book that you mentioned in Fiercely Loyal is that when I entered the workforce, you and I are in the same age bracket. I think I'm a little older than you, but in the same age bracket, when we were entering into the workforce, we were asked, what do you want to do? That was a 40-year question, 20 to 40 years at least. What do you want to do? Today, when you ask a millennial, what do you want to do a career? It's a four-year question. Ten times faster are they changing careers. And if you don't understand that, you're never going to be able to keep your top people. One of the things I loved about North America was this entrepreneurial spirit. And, it was, and I think if I'd have stayed in the UK, even though I was very entrepreneurial and I started my business very young, that pressure of living in what was a labor-based society, Australia, which is also labor, you know, um, socialist, it's not socialist, but socialist type, same with the UK. I, I'm in favor of a lot of that stuff, but I'm also like, you know, you, you are responsible for your own life. You're responsible for your own success. And if you don't step into that and claim it and own it, then you're always at the whim of a boss or of a partner or of something like that. And young lawyers are, are coming up or entrepreneurial. They're not going to look at that world the same way. And you're going to get upset with them that they're ready to jump ship so quickly. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, we'll get we'll get right into that on how you can retain people later on. So, how did you find yourself entering into the uh, business leadership and uh, leadership for? I know you talked about small businesses, large businesses, also uh, leadership within families. How did you get into this business originally? Uh, originally, um, so as I as you and I have talked about, I studied odd odd things, and I was studying metaphysical studies. I was studying. Uh, psychology and and in 84 studies studying quantum physics all the time running businesses while I was doing this but studying those things and one of the businesses I had a friend of mine a guy who was he actually owned a national menswear company in the U in Australia and he came in one day and he said I, I want you to come in and speak for us and I'm like what are you talking about I'm not a speaker because you know I want you to come in and speak for for, for all my national the managers from the national like about what? And he goes, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, okay. Um, how long do you want me to speak for? He goes, an hour. I'm like, an hour? Are you crazy? <laughs> I'm not speak for an hour. And now it's a warm up. But then it was like, yeah. it totally freaked me out. And I said, well, what do you want me to speak about? And he goes, anything you want. He goes, but I have one, just one uh, proviso. And I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. What's this? And he goes, you've got to look the way you look today. Now, I was 23 years old at the time. I'd love to see that. <laughs> I was 23 years old at the time. And the way I'd met him was he owned a national menswear clothes. I said, so he had beautiful suits. And he used to make my suits. I loved suits, beautiful suits. But when I wasn't in a suit, I was a 23-year-old bodybuilder with hair down to my chest that looked like, uh, you know, like the, the Louis XIII ringlets. That this was is the my, 70s, back in the 70s. 80s, yeah. 19, early 80s. All right, right, okay. So I've got long ringlet curly hair down in my chest, designer stubble. Um, I've got earrings that are big enough, big loops that are big enough to hang parrots off them. <laughs> and I'm a bodybuilder back in the, like, now I don't take, show my body at all. But back then, you know, it was all ego. And I would wear T-shirts that were too tight to make sure with ripped jeans. And he said, that my, one, my one request is that you show up dressed exactly how you are today. And my hair wasn't even in a ponytail, it was out. And I'm like, Steve, you know I don't dress like this all the time. And he goes, I know, but I want you to come like that. And I'm like, are you sure? I'm talking to national managers from menswear companies. He says, I want you to turn up like that. Okay. So I turn up on the appropriate day. 
And as instructed, I put my head in the door. He's instructed me, make sure they see you and then just wait. So I did that. And I don't know whether you allow swearing because you may have to blate this, but <laughs> I put my head in the door and uh, these guys in their very uptight suits and ties are looking at me and, and they're giving me what we used to call in Salford, the fuck off nod, <laughs> which, is, which is fuck off, get out of here, you're in the wrong place. And they're just looking at me like that. And I just waited. And then Steve said, please welcome our speaker. And I come up, you know, clunk, jaws hit the desk. And they're like, what the hell's going on? Steve goes to the back of the room so I can see Steve. And they're all looking at me. And I honestly don't remember what I spoke about. But I remember my opening. And what I said to them, it was the 80s. Racism was a massive issue with the Aborigines in Australia at the time. And I said, put your hand up if you're a racist. Now, of course, nobody's going to put their hand up. I know that. And I said, put your hand up if you would judge somebody by the way they look, by the color of their skin, or by their financial situation. Nobody put their hand up. And I said, you're a bunch of freaking liars. Man, I got their attention. Every one of you judge me based on the way I look. You decided how much money I had and how intelligent I was and how, how viable anything I would have to say or do is based on how I would look. I said, and that's a problem because I am a customer. That's how I know Steve. You guys make my suits, but I don't always wear them. And I look over at Steve at this point, I think maybe I've shit the bed because I may have, <laughs> go over, right? But I look over at Steve and he looks like his face has been cut open in joy. He obviously was a lot smarter than me. He knew what he was doing. And, you know, that changed everything. And afterwards, he was very, I mean, got rousing applause. It was fantastic. At the end, Steve was very appreciative. And if the story ended there, I would be the hero. And it would be the launch of a career. But I wasn't the hero. Steve was the hero. He saw what I did. I was the idiot. And I'll tell you why. Because about two weeks later, he came to me and said, this other guy wanted me to come speak for his company. Would I be willing to do it? And I was like, sure. Now, I, you know, now it's a good time. Sure. So what did I do? I went and did my research. And I said, well, what is a speaker? How is how a speaker side? So when I bought some cassette tapes, as we did in those days. And I started looking at the pictures and found even LPs of people <laughs> who were speakers, and I saw Zig Ziglar and Dennis Waitley and Jim Rohn, and what did I notice? I noticed they were all old, number one. I was 20, almost 24 years old. They were all old, they were all wearing the uniform, which was a blue suit, white shirt, red tie. And so what did I do? Cut off my hair into a nasty haircut, bought, bought the uniform, blue suit, white shirt, red tie, and shaved my beard into some nasty looking caterpillar on top of my lip. <laughs> I wish I'd seen this. Oh, I, I, I've got a photograph. You and oh, I were to send I've, actually got, I've got a photograph that was given to me by somebody who was in one of my original trainings 25 years before I met him. And he said, this is the picture. And there's a picture of me, him, and this photograph of me from a brochure. And he goes, the guy in the brochure looks older than you do now. Because <laughs> right? I was trying to look older. That's because I thought that's what I had to be. And I died a death. Because the very thing that endeared the audience to me, certainly it challenged the crap out of them, but actually endeared them to me was my authenticity. Absolutely, absolutely. And I gave it away. And this is one of the challenges we do. We get into a role as we're the lawyer. This is how I'm supposed to look. This is how I'm supposed to speak. This is how I'm supposed to be. No, no, that's actually not true. That's another universe. That's leading 20 years ago. That's lawyering 20 years ago. People connect to people they connect to. And if I can't connect to you, I will simply go and find another lawyer who's got your ability, but is actually more personable, more authentic, more real. That's what we're pulled to. And if you're gonna deal with millennials, either as employees or as customers, you better know how to connect. And that comes from your authenticity. Yeah, that what you say there is very similar to uh, the writings and uh, the teachings of Chrissy Lightfoot. She's been on the podcast here. She's uh, written a book called The Naked Lawyer. It's a similar concept to your full Monty leadership. It's essentially that lawyers need to reach out and relate. They need to be more human. They need to throw off, as it were, metaphorically, get naked to throw off the old lawyerly garbs because the clients out there need people to relate to. And certainly 
uh, millennials need that as well. And as you said Absolutely. in in your in your uh, podcast and so forth, they're fifty percent of the population now. Well, um, you have to realize they are the fastest growing since twenty fifteen, the fastest growing member of the workforce, and the baby boomers. In the, from the work age are retiring at 10,000 a day. So if you go, well, I just want to, don't want to deal with millennials. Well, okay, congratulations. You're either dead or your business is because that's what you're predicting. If you don't want to deal with them, you know, so I, had a, I, was on, I told you I was on an interview just before you because I do about three interviews a week as well as interviewing others. I'm a guest on shows. And, and, and one of the, the guy on this, the business guy on there said to me, but how do you deal with these millennials? You know, uh, you, you phone them, they won't pick up the phone, but they'll answer text. And I go, let's get in a time machine, shall we? And they go, let's go back 100 years and ask the boss if he's pissed off that his people won't respond by telegraph. Yeah. You're upset with technology. You can't be upset with technology. That makes you a dinosaur. If they're not responding to you in the way that you want, respond to them in the way that they communicate. It's a basic communication skill that applies to technology. It's very simple. So if you're going, well, you should respect the fact that I've got my degree and I've got, I went through the bar and I get to wear the, the, the silly wig and I get to wear the cape and, you know, and pretend that I'm Batman in a bad wig while, while standing up for the law. And if you think that that's what's going to earn your respect, it isn't. Yeah. I appreciate it. I can respect the effort and the energy and the discipline you put into that. But if I've got a choice between you and somebody who's human, who also has to do the same things as you do, I'm going to go with that every time. Yeah. yeah. So you've written a lot about how, um, in your book, Fiercely Loyal, you've written about how the generations, our generations that have gone before um, we've gone before the millennials. We have to adjust our leadership style now to accommodate the way uh, millennials value things, the way they see the world. Can you talk us, talk us through a bit more about that and how that might relate to lawyers? Absolutely. So here's the question. As you know, I work with leaders around the world in, in a large variety, whether they are Fortune 500, whether they're high-level entrepreneurs, whether they're in the entertainment world, and many lawyers, by the way. Um, and, and I say, I'll ask them, do you know your purpose? Do you know your purpose? 99% of people don't. It doesn't say that 99% will say that they don't, but they don't. Because about 50% of a room will usually say they know their purpose, but when I question them on it, they don't. They have a mission statement, that's not a purpose. You know? And they say, well, isn't the purpose of business to make money? Absolutely. But that's... Take that as a foregone conclusion. Because here's the thing, nobody's gonna come and work for you in order for you to get a better yacht. Nobody's lining up and go, oh, let me go work for Steven so that I can get him a better yacht. They're not doing that. They have to feel a connection to what it is you're doing and you have to know what that purpose is for you. What is it that drives you? Because here's the thing, number one thing for millennials when looking for jobs, is meaningful work. It's the number one thing above money. Money matters, but only to a point. But it's meaningful work matters every single time. We think millennials are entitled little shits. But here's the truth. Millennials volunteer more of their time than any other generation. So how do you... That doesn't compute. You're entitled shits who give away a lot and you volunteer a lot and you fight for causes. No, we're looking at millennials through baby boomer lenses and we need to wear millennial lenses. And if you want to employ the very best millennials, you want to keep them loyal to you, you have got to have meaning. So you've got to know your purpose as an organization and as an individual. We're working with a company right now. There, there are, there's two parts to the company. One is construction development and the other side is health tech. So health technologies, phenomenal brain science stuff and we're working with both sides of the company and the umbrella company the founder of the company is 77 years old he's stuck in his ways and he's right leading with an iron rod and he's pushing people away so fast the two i see the second in command is is much younger he's 50 years old but actually younger mentally 
um, attitude wise, understands we got to have purpose. We've been, been brought in to do the purpose side of it. His people are like attracting. He's like, we've got so many people who want to come work for us because we've stated this purpose. But you can't just state it. You have to own the purpose. Why do we do what we do? There's very few people who can answer that question. I said, why do you do what you do? Beyond the money, why does it matter? I'm asking you, the lawyer listening to this right now, why are you doing what you do? Because the chances are there was an originating reason why you did it, and you may have lost touch with that. And I challenge you to go back and look at why it was. Because you might have wanted to stand for justice, and you might have wanted to fight for the small man or whatever it is. And now what it's about is buying a better house and making things better. Go back to that original place. That's where you'll get your fire back. Once you get that fire, you become a better lawyer, but you attract people to you. People want to connect to people who are connected to themselves and to meaning. This is what we've got to do. And you've written about how if you do not uh, provide this sort of environment, if you're not the sort of person that is being authentic, that is showing a purpose, how long is it going to be? Is it likely to be on average before your millennials? Let's say we've taken lawyers who've qualified. Yep. Course, so they've gone through their training. How long might it be before they decide to jump ship? And what's the imp implications for that, for the amount of money that you've invested in trying to train Great money? question. Fabulous question. Because as I said, when we started out, it was, what do you want to do? You, you chose a career. It was law. And then you look for a firm to get into that you could be with until you made partner and you retired and got your golden handshake. Okay. Well, here's what you need to know about millennials. The average millennial changes jobs every 1.2 to two years. Now, you go, oh, so, so they're just, you know, unreliable. No, you have to look at it from your side. And your side is you're going to spend 1.5 to two times the annual salary of that individual on training and development. Now think, I'm just making up a number here just so you can work with me. So if you're paying them $100,000, you are going to spend between one hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000 on their training and development to get them up to speed in order for them to be making you money. Okay, and they leave you in 1.2 years, you lost money hiring this person. And you go, well, it's because it was a bad hire. Well, no, because now you've got the next one coming in and it's exactly the same. So the implications are financially devastating. So what you actually want to do is to keep a millennial for what's called a career length, which is four years. We work with companies, pull them back to their purpose, We've got people now seven years in. Millennials, seven years in the same company. Why? Because we've actually changed their career inside of the organization. So they're still, quote, a lawyer, but the focus has shifted, and they've got a new career inside that. And, they've, and this is the other thing that I encourage uh, lawyers to do and, and business people to do is when I started in my, in my business, it was expensive to start. Now a millennial can start a business for 20 bucks. Buy a URL, start a website, I can go into business. You are not their only best option. So because they're entrepreneurial, you have got to create an environment that is intrapreneurial, meaning allow them to think and operate like an entrepreneur inside of your company. Profit sharing is left for the partners. It can't be anymore. You won't keep your top people. You want to keep top people, you've got to have them become part of the business very quickly. You've got to have them become part of the connection to the business very quickly. So to the meaning of the business and to the entrepreneurial efforts of the business. I mean, that's very challenging for when, when you think about most law firms are run as partnerships and you get the salaried partners to start with where they're essentially given a title. They're still on a salary, but they're, they're, they're doing a lot more of the marketing. But then it's only when you get to the top grade that you become an equity partner. So I could see that as being challenging for a lot of partnerships, but there are other ways of doing it. I was at the Legal Geek Conference, which is a big legal tech conference in um, October. And one of the key things that a speaker said there is they said, look, now that we're all trying to, as law firms, look to solutions that may be AI driven, automations, that's the way things are going. We have to accept that ideas are going to come from everywhere. So we're Absolutely. going to need a new type of leadership. And they were using words like compassion, nurturing, 
um, flatter leadership structures. What can you say as uh, advice to law firms who are looking to make the most of all the people within the firm who may have an inclination to come up with solutions that may be based around non-traditional methods of delivery. For example, we come up with some sort of AI or automation solution. What advice would you have for law firms in terms of the way they try to lead those sorts of teams? That's a really great question. And, and again, I'm back to the same thing, which is please stop trying to lead like it's 20, 30 years ago. Just please just stop because you're going to kill your own business. Um, so uh, in, in this book, one of the things that I talked about is the four C's. And, if you, and you've got to really grasp this. This is so valuable. So the four C's, I'll just tell you what they are and I'll go through them. Cooperation, collaboration, contribution, and community. Those are the four C's. Keeping millennials loyal for you. Your business has to be not just seen as but operating as from that place of the four C's. So how are we cooperating? How are we collaborating? How are we contributing? And how are we adding to a community? So cooperation is, instead of isolating people, which has been a tendency, to how can we cooperate with each other? So and this is going to sound weird, but we actually have to kill the word co um, competition. We actually have to get rid of it. We're going to be competitive in nature, particularly A-types, but we actually have to look at it not as you're my competition, but you are the person I'm going to cooperate with. And how can we come together, which is part of the entrepreneurial thing? Number one, collaboration. This is one of the things we're seeing a lot of in a lot of different businesses, and it's bubbling to the services even in more traditional, quote, stodgy businesses, like maybe like law or accounting. And that is we just did some work with an accounting company the last few years, and we've been working with them for a few years. And what we did was we got them to collaborate with their competition. Yeah, you're like, seeing a lot of this in law anyway. You're great. starting to see this. People collaborate can, with your yeah. competition. If you come from a place of service, how can we serve our customer better? Then I need to collaborate with my, with my competitor. I, I'm collaborating constantly with people who are going for the same gigs as I'm gigging. My, my direct competition are now my friends. We collaborate together so that, and when a gig comes up, we go, oh, yeah, thanks for the gig. And let me recommend Jim to you because he's fantastic too. So cooperation, collaboration, then contribution. What is the representation of your organization to contribute? How are you contributing? How are you contributing? And this is where it ties into community. To the community at large, so meaning the community of law. How are you contributing to that? Not with your fabulous papers that you wrote, and isn't it wonderful that you were written up in the law journal, but how are you actually contributing to the community as, a, as thinking it as, a, as a human entity? How do you add value to it? How are you contributing to that community of, of the industry? Then how do you contribute to your local community? And not just talking about the tax write-off and that you wrote to, you wrote a check for some local charity. That's nice. But did you go out in the streets and do something that doesn't reflect good in the law practice particularly? So did you go out and buy a bunch of blankets for the homeless people? Because none of those are going to be your next customer. Now, it is great PR. I won't take that away. But that's not why you're doing it. But the people who work inside of your company who are millennials will go, oh, okay. These people give a shit. They care. So you need the four C's. And, and you can't do that without being human. So this is one of the things that's so important. You know, you touched on it, but I want to bring it to it, if I may, which is vulnerability, empathy, and compassion. Can we, is it okay for us? Absolutely, to that's exactly where I wanted to go next. That was the vulnerability word. That is gonna be very challenging, I think, for a lot of lawyers. Now, I know about it, because I've done, in setting up Lawyers of Tomorrow Technology and Lawyers of Tomorrow Media, I've been on a diet of lots of business um, learnings and so forth. So the concept of vulnerability and why it is an advantage um, is great. And, and Itzik and I talked about this when we were talking about relationship capital. You have to give something of yourself, give sincere attention. But I think that's a very challenging uh, concept for lawyers. So I'm going to play devil's advocate a bit here, hand you the floor and say, so what is vulnerability? Why is it so important for getting fierce loyalty? And how can lawyers 
put this into practice when a lot of them, like you've written about this, they said they might be maybe worried that they're doing emotional vomit and lawyers have been trained to try and keep the emotion away. So over to you, yeah. Dov. What, do you, what, what, what's, what are your teachings on the question those, of those issue are, of loyalty? Those are great and very valid points. And, it, and I think that, at number one, we were trained that vulnerability is weakness and we still hold that in our framework and we've got to change the frame. Um, but the analogy I will give you is simply this for everybody to just play with this. And then, then, then we can have the argument about it being professional. So the first one is this. I want you in your mind to picture that, that in front of you on the right, you have somebody that you've known for three to five years who is a loyal, trusted friend. And on the other side of you, you have somebody you've known also for three to five years and they are an acquaintance. And the first question is, what's the difference? You can't say it's time. So what's the difference? The difference is disclosure. It's vulnerability. And in simple language, your dear trusted friend knows your shit and you know that. And you're not judging each other from that place. You value each other and you've been there for each other, but you know about each other's stuff without willing to throw it in their face. Part of our fear with vulnerability is that somebody will use it as a weapon against us. And there's a pretty good chance that somewhere in your life experience, somebody's done that. So what? So what? Somebody has given you a, a bad term for a good deed. That's part of life. So that, that can't rule us the roost. The distinction then becomes, well, okay, dog, I get this. All right. I, I can kind of get the idea, but oh, I mean, you know, I've been at a party or I've been at a social or I've been at a networking and this person comes up and is telling me about how their daughter's going through a divorce and their mother has cancer. And I want to just smash them on the head with the nearest blunt object because they're emotionally vomiting on me. Are you telling me that's what I need to do? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. As a lawyer, you are trained to pay attention. So pay attention to the be discerning about how much you're delivering. But it has to be reciprocity. And as a leader, you, leaders go first. So you reveal a little and pay attention to what you get back. What you get back will reveal to you how much more. So don't just go in and just emotionally vomit over anybody. So, you know, as you're meeting somebody, it's like, you know, you could talk about it a lot, you know, but like, I'm a married person, um, you know, and I have three kids and my kids are six, 10 and 12. This is not me speaking, but I'm pretending, right? And the person says, oh yeah, that's cool. I've got a couple of kids too, yeah. Oh, how old are yours? Mine are also around that same age. My little girl, she plays volleyball. Oh, really? And you start this, and you're only going a step by a step, but you must lead. That builds the bond. It's not about emotionally vomiting on people. It's about creating a safety for them to know your humanity. It is that first. Humanity first, expertise second. And as a lawyer or as an accountant or as somebody in those very professional word, worlds, we think it's expertise first. It's not. It's humanity first. It's absolutely humanity first. You, can't get, you could get away with that stuff 30 years ago. I promise you, you could. It was fine. You can't today. The generations have changed. Now, if you're dealing with customers and your customers are 60 plus years old, you might still be able to get away with it. That, that, those are your primary target people. But, you know, I, as you know, I do a lot of work with multi-generational family wealth businesses. And so we've got this, we've got these founders who are 70, 80 years old. And, you know, and their, their advisors are also looking down on the, and, and I'm looking at these advisors and I'm going, you do know you're out of business, right? And they go, hey, what are you talking about? We're handling a hundred billion dollars. And I go, you're out of business. And they go, what do you mean? Next gen leaders coming up, you've been treating them like shit for years. Do you think they're going to be loyal to you? But we know, we know this business inside and out. They don't care. They've got buddies they went to school with, that they went to business school with, who are now doing the same thing you do. They trust them and they've never treated them poorly. Why would they come to you? So it's the relationship first. 
Yeah. Exactly what Isaac talks about. Well, it's relationship yeah. first. And it's the trust issue. Gary Vaynerchuk, who we both are very influenced by, he's talked about this with trust. He says, I don't have a problem with trust. I immediately give you my trust. I mean, that's, and I think that's a key there. Rather than expecting trust, you have to, like you said, you give a bit of trust and you see what you come back. So Gary has often talked about it. Around, around respect, right? You know, well, you need to respect me because I've got 15 degrees. No, you need to earn my respect. Well, how do you earn my respect? Give me respect. The fastest way to earn somebody's respect is to give them respect. The first way to understand, to get somebody's trust is to trust them. Be vulnerable. Reveal something about yourself. It's okay if there's a little bit of shock that you would do that. Really? You're a lawyer and you're telling me this? Yes, there's like, because I have a, I have a framework in which I've put lawyers in and go, they don't do that. But immediately you shatter that. Yeah. Now I want to engage. It's the same concept that Chrissy Lightfoot talks about, the reach out and the relate, be human, be real, and then you will make the connections. You will make the, you will make a much better, stronger relationships. The Itzik and you are saying the same sort of thing. Let's talk a bit, a, a little bit about the neuroscience, because I know you've done a bit of um, um, re research, or you've certainly read a lot of research on this. What's the neuroscience behind fierce loyalty? So, it, and again, it's a great question. I appreciate you asking it because oftentimes it's not asked. And so when you think about um, getting people to be loyal, what are you trying to do? Well, at a business level, you want them to stick around long enough for you to get your ROI. But you don't look at your kids that way. You don't look at your wife that way. You don't look at your husband that way. You don't look at your partners that way. So why do you do it in business? It's really quite foolish. And so what do we know? We know, um, again, scientific research shows that human beings are first and foremost tribal. We want to bond. And we actually have neurochemistry to make us do that. So I'll tell you a central belief of mine. This is part of my personal philosophy. The central belief of mine is that you were born whole, complete, and miraculous. That's not religious but it's a freaking miracle out of all the potentiality of you turning into a human yeah. being. It's pretty miraculous. And you were born whole and complete. I mean, do you have, do you have children, Steve? Yeah. Do you yeah, remember when you first held a young child? Sorry? A newborn? Do you oh, remember? Fantastic. New... I was in tears. I was, of course. I was, I was there in the room. We did it all in a pool and I was doing the massage. I'm an integral part of the birthing right. partner. Yeah. I was in tears of joy. It was beautiful. Yeah. It's amazing. You hold this newborn baby in your, in your arm and the head's in your hand and the length of the body is your forearm and you just look at that baby and you go, wow, you are miraculous. Yeah. You are amazing. You, are, you don't go, you know, you're pretty awesome, but you could really do it a bit more self-esteem. <laughs> I wish you were more confident. I wish you were better at sales. All that shit is stuff we put on later. Yeah. And the moment you're born, you're already whole and complete and magnificent. And that is the piece that all of us yearn for, is to be seen in that way. But in that moment, as you hold that child, your brain, your hypothalamus, which is the, the mood and appetite center of your brain, produces chemistry, and it produces a whole neurochemical cascade uh, um, of chemicals that are released from your brain, one of which is oxytocin. Yeah. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone. The reason you fell in love was because of oxytocin and PEA. There's a whole, chem a whole chemistry there, but oxytocin is the bonding hormone. When do we bond to people? We bond to people when there's an emotional connection. You've seen movies and you've fallen in love with a character. Why? This is ridiculous. This is lights on a screen. Why am I so emotionally evoked by this thing on this? It's, it's logically, rationally. This is, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm looking at lights flash on a screen in tiny pixels that make up an image of a person who's not really there and I'm falling in love or I'm pissed off or I'm whatever it is. It's because in your brain, there's a neurochemical response to the stimuli. Your job is to create that in the people you work with, you engage, that you are your clients, that are your co-workers that are anybody you're in a relationship with. You and I met through another environment 
some of the people in the environment, like you and I, have created a connection. We spent some time together. I shared some stuff. You shared some stuff. We were open and vulnerable with each other. And it was in the emotional content that we made the connection because the framework was the same for everybody in the program. But vastly different because there was a revelation. You shared some things with me. I shared some with you. And you said that when you initially sort of saw me, you thought I might be a bit tough and a bit, you know. Grizzly the, Dove. <laughs> what's that? Grizzly Dove. I thought this guy looks, this guy looks quite tough. But you know, you're a big, you're a big teddy bear underneath it all, I think. Oh, my name Dove literally <laughs> translates to bear. Oh, really? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I can look grizzly, but the truth is I'm yeah. a teddy bear. But... It's only in, in my revelation of who I am that you get past the, 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 the rigidity of your own framework. We all have them. Yeah. We make these judgments. But once we reveal, we start tearing down at people's judgments without trying to. It just naturally yeah. happens. And that's when what happens then. The oxytocin starts to flow and we create this bond. There's a neurochemical response. Your job in whatever it is you do in your relationships and in your uh, business is to release that in others. Yeah. Now, how do you release it again by revealing, by revealing yourself. And what does that revelation do? It makes it safe for the other person to reveal. And when two people reveal with each other, that becomes a common bond. Put two people in a stressful situation. You create a bond. Yeah. Thanks for that, Dov. That's a great explanation. And let's now bounce over to a linked idea. What is the science behind when you want to get people who are working for you to be creative and innovative? And this is the big buzzword that came out of the Legal Geek Conference, that lawyers, we're just starting to get entrepreneurial now. And we're just starting to get the idea that with legal tech, we're, we're only at the beginning. So law firms need people to be innovative so what's the environment what's the science behind the environment that you need to create so that people will then respond in a creative and entrepreneurial way that's again a great question so here's the thing you know we there's a lot of buzz around fail forward there's a lot of buzz around you know you've got to encourage failure and all of that and that's a nice idea but it's kind of scary if your business could go down the toilet with failures so you know, and I'm trying to remember his name, uh, the guy who was at Google who was in charge of this, and they celebrate failures. They actually, if you fail, there's a, there's a time frame, you go through the work, you go through the steps. And if you fail, everybody celebrates that. Because yeah. it's like, we discovered how not to do it. Exactly. Fantastic. Very much a legal tech approach. Certainly right. with the incubators at the moment. Very much exactly. the approach. So how do you catalyze innovation? We've gone in and done a lot of work around this. And the truth of the matter is, that innovation is, you know, we think of it as creativity, we think of it as a lot of thinking, but it's actually an emotional response. This is what's cool about it. It's actually an emotional response. So innovation is born of emotional safety. You see, if I'm working for you and you said, yeah, I want you to be innovative, I want you to come up with things, but when you do things wrong, I'm going to slap you hard. I learned pretty quickly, don't be innovative. It isn't safe to be innovative. It isn't safe for me to have a creative thought. There is a very narrow parameter that I'm allowed to operate. So if you want to create innovation, you have to create emotional safety. Emotional safety, again, comes from vulnerability, from compassion, from empathy, and from rewarding failure. Not as in, oh, isn't it great you failed, but rewarding the, the expansive thinking. Rewarding. This is one of the reasons I like doing masterminds. It's one of the reasons that I like doing um, playing brain games with people around things. I go, okay, so what's the problem? And they go, okay, this is the problem. Let's write the problem on the board. Right. Now, what we're going to do is I want you to come up with 10 things that could possibly work with this. And then I'm going to come up with three more that have got nothing to do with it. And they go, what? And we did this with an international company. So they come up with the, the big problem, blah, blah, blah. And these are, the three, uh, these are the top 10 solutions that we think are going to work great. And I go, okay, so I'm going to now throw three things in, but you've got to answer those as if they're real. And they go, okay, what were they? And I, I remember two of them off the top of my head. One was quantum physics, and the other one was Monty Python. Seemed to have nothing to do with the subject. But I said, but if you were writing for Monty Python, dealing with this problem, how would you answer it? 
And one of the guys said, with a fish. And I go, perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> because that creates the creativity. That creates the flow. Because creativity only exists outside of the comfort zone. It only ex exists outside of the rigidity. So you've got to create safety. Emotional safety facilitates creativity and innovation. Number yeah. one. That's it. And I think a lot of the law firms now, they have sussed that what they need to do is they need to allow themselves a space in which to, to do this, to fail. So there's one, uh, what's, the, what's the Dentons have got their own, own self, can, it's, a cell, uh, it's a wholly owned subsidiary where they are allowing themselves to just experiment, experiment with legal tech. And, they, and every, the, the view is every failure you, you go through, you're getting one step nearer to it. So that's very interesting. Dov, I don't want to take much more of your time here because I know you're a very busy man. If people are going to come and do training with you in your full Monty um, organization, first of all, let us know what that, where, where, the, where the name comes from on that. Can you talk me through the sort of customer experience that they go through? How do you get them and get them to, to free up so that they become much better leaders? How do you deal with lawyers as you're um, putting them through the full Monty leadership process? <laughs> Well, as you said, Full Monty, uh, my website is fullmontyleadership.com. And it's Full Monty because like in the movie, I mean, it was a bunch of guys, as you may remember, who uh, saw something like the Chippendales come through a town where nobody had any money and the Chippendales were getting paid very well. But they were also young, hot guys. But they, they always kept their underwear on or some, some resemblance of an underwear. And these guys were unemployed and broke and certainly, you know, barely could dance, let alone not being very attractive. And so they, I mean, the, the, the realization was that they had to do something different than even a better looking group could do. And that was reveal it all, go for Monty, as you and I know. So it's that point of distinction is to reveal what others won't. To so go a step further than others will, are willing to go is part of how you make the distinction that separates you as a brand from others. This is also a very big, important point of it, is it becomes a point of distinction. You know, it's one thing to say, we care. At, at Bradley and Bradley, we care. Everybody says that shit. But where's your evidence? Your evidence is that you're willing to go full Monty. That's a point of distinction. So when we working with these leaders, often, as I said, they often don't come in with that, that mentality. But one of the first things that we'll do, because we have to vet, we pick every client we work with, whether that's whether I'm one on one working with them as a in my one on one coaching mentoring or whether they're a company, we start to vet them to find out how hungry they are. How, how much do you really want this? How important is this? really to you, will you back away when it starts getting a bit difficult? Because it's like anything else, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. But when you get to that place, that's when it all transforms. And the cool thing about it is it, it doesn't just transform your business, it transforms your life. That's what I love about it. This is transformative leadership for the human being that has impact on their business. So what happens first of all is we start looking at, as with any business, we have to look at, where are the challenges, number one? And how would that challenge, how might that challenge be removed if you were emotionally connected at a deeper level to your employees and to your potential customers? So a lot of lawyers and professionals don't believe that's the case until we start walking them through some scenarios. What would happen if this happened? Oh, I never thought about that. Okay, and then we'll do a side by side. So we've got this very professional person over here, and we've got you, who's working with me, and I'm helping you. And we've got this person, equal qualification. And Charlie shows up with a problem that is the problem that you both can solve. And Charlie decides to interview you both. Who's going to get it? And the truth of the matter is, we do business with people we like, know, and trust. So you have to make sure they know, like, and trust you very quickly. So that's the first thing. You start looking at some scenario outcomes from that. Then we ask the question, what is the purpose of your organization? Well, we're a law firm. Our purpose is to, to help people win cases. No, that's what you do. That's not your purpose. 
Oh, well, I purpose is to make money. No, that's what your business has to do. But what is the purpose? I don't know. Good answer. Then we start looking at what, what it is that, what we call the primary driver. And the primary driver in, in every individual is, there are many similar ones, but the nuance of it is so incredibly human and subjective. And, you know, if there's seven and a half billion people on the planet, then that's how many different versions of Interesting. Families. And what sort of, what sort of, if you can tell me, what sort of revelations do they come out with? And what effect does it have on them when they think, hang on, it's not just about money. It's not just about being the best or whatever. What sort of revelations do they come out with as they discover what their purpose is? And then what impact does that have on them going forward? Because no doubt they feed back to you. On this. Yeah, so... Um, it, it changes absolutely everything uh, for them because the fact of the matter is that you, me, we are all impacted in our lives. Stuff happened. And we can go away and get our degrees and we can do all those things. But a lot of the time it covers up. And people say, well, that was the past. Well, here's the news. Your past is leaking all over your present. So getting to, to what is it that unconsciously is driving me because what's unconsciously driving me negatively is what I'm actually trying to heal, bring whole. We always say, uh, and then this is nothing religious about this, but we say you, that we actually go into business to reconcile our soul, to bring back the disenfranchised parts of ourselves that were made wrong. When you do that, you get such a deep connection to yourself that you, I mean, I know before I did that work, I was, I got to a place and where I got, where I was ready to walk away. And I told people I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. But once I'd done that work, mm -hmm. I was doing it again. And people said, I thought you weren't going to do this anymore. And I said, I'm not doing it. And they go, yeah, you are. You said you weren't going to speak, write books and work one-on-one -on -one with clients. And I go, uh-huh. And they go, well, that's what you're doing. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. I can see you're doing it. No, I, it looks the same. But where I'm doing it from is vastly different. Mm -hmm. That's the distinction. Where you do it from. When you get connected to your purpose, where you do it from. So you go from, quote, success to fulfillment, which is far more valuable. And what sort of purposes have, have people, for example, as lawyers that you've trained before, found within themselves then? Well, very often, it, you know, the example is um, injustice. Yeah. A lot of people will find themselves in the law profession because they saw injustice. So here's the thing. I'm just going to make it clear for everybody. People think that their purpose is their passion. Your purpose is not your passion. How do I know? Because most of us men are not gynecologists. And pretty much at 15, that's what we were passionate about. So if <laughs> your career was supposed to be your passion, then we'd all be in gynecology or, or examining breasts for a living. That's not what we do. So your passion is transitory. Mm -hmm. Your purpose is carried in the vehicle of your passion often, but it's not your vehicle. Your, if you want to find your purpose, you've got to look to the place you don't want to look. As Carl Jung talked about, and as uh, Joseph Campbell talked about, if you want to find your bliss, find your purpose, not your passion, but your purpose, you must go into the darkest cave that you fear to enter. Your purpose is hidden behind your pain. Really? Always. That's, that's pretty deep, Dov. I didn't expect to do that on Lawyers of Tomorrow. <laughs> that's where your purpose is. The thing that inspired you to be a lawyer yeah. at the deepest level came out of pain. So maybe the landlord threw your mom out of the house when she couldn't pay the rent when you were a kid. And, you know, you found out 20 years later that if she'd have had the right representation or have had the right legal knowledge, that wouldn't have happened. And so you, you, there was an impetus there to, to, to make something right that was wrong. It might be your pain. It might be the pain of somebody you love. Now, think about it. I'm just going to help everybody understand this for a minute. Everybody's familiar with um, Uber. How did Uber come about? Because guys got sick. Of, the guys are telling got sick of stepping out into the rain in New York City trying to flag a, uh, a yellow cab. Is it a big emotional pain? No, but it was a pain. And they went, this is bull. Let's, yeah. This should be easier. And they created it. The guy who created Netflix walked into Blockbuster after driving there, walked in, found a movie that he wanted to rent, 
got lined up at the front desk, got there, and they said, oh, there's no movie in here. The person hasn't returned it. Got pissed off and said, this is not right. And they're inconvenience pain. So it can be a big emotional pain. It can be an inconvenience pain. Airbnb was started by guys who wanted to bring a bunch of people together for a conference and couldn't find hotel rooms. And they said, well, just bring an air mattress and you can sleep at my house. Hence, Airbnb. Yeah. It's, so your purpose is facilitated out of your pain or your frustration that is either yours or people you care about. Well, this ties in very neatly with the whole way people are approaching legal tech now. I was interviewing a guy who used to be a city lawyer. He said, I used to look at the way contracts were being performed. And I just thought this is a ridiculous way of doing it. And out of that pain point, it came, they can become a solution. So it's a very similar process to look within yourself to see what the pain point there was and then see, see what, what, what was ignited within you. There's a great book called... Um, uh, Destructive innovation, I think yeah. it's called. I'll have to come back to it. Seth Merrin is the, is the uh, writer. Great book. I had him on my show. Um, and one of the things he talked about was not the need to innovate, but the need to destroy, to actually wipe it out. And one of the things he talks about is where in your business do you look at it as the cost of doing business? This is just what we have to put up with. And you need to destroy that. So this lawyer you just talked about, I said, this is bull. We shouldn't have yeah. to do this. Every other lawyer goes, well, it's just what you have to do. You need to look at your entire business. And this is one of the things I ask the people I work with. Who is the Uber of your industry? And they go, sometimes they know. And sometimes they go, I don't know. And I go, well, if you don't become it, somebody else will. And you'll be unemployed. Yeah. You'll be back. The whole legal profession is in that process at the moment, looking right. at things and saying, right, where is the next Uber? That's what they're all doing. Yeah. The smart ones. Others, you know, the early majority, the, uh, the, the converts, um, uh, that's what the way they're looking. You know, if they're not moving already, yeah, they, sh they should be. Yeah. Well, Dov, that has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for this. I like to finish off my pods with a couple of questions which are a little bit off, off the wall here. Imagine you could phone yourself in the past. You could pick up a phone. You could phone yourself in the past and have a conversation with yourself 20 years ago. Would you make the call? And Absolutely. what would you say? What would you say to that guy 20 years ago? Um, I would say, there's many things I would say. Uh, number one, make sure that you, you're checking every day, all day long, that you're living on purpose. Yeah. You know what your purpose is and you're living on purpose. Systemize your business so that you understand what it is you do and how you do it. Most of us have unconscious competence about what we do so that it's repeatable. Care even more, because I always care, but care even more about the people you're, you're, you're interacting with. And I think when it comes after all that, so systemize my business, I'm living on purpose, I'm checking that I'm doing that. I would say that the thing I would say to myself 20 years ago more than anything is remember, you're already whole, you're already complete. There's nothing to fix and everything to reveal. Yeah, super, super. Um, okay, well, Dov, that has been absolutely wonderful. Um, how do people get in touch with you if they're interested in learning more about Full Monty Leadership? Uh, maybe maybe uh, taking you up on some leadership guidance? Thank you for asking. So I appreciate it, mate. Um, you can find me, again, as you said, at fullmontyleadership.com. You can find me uh, in the way that you've talked about through YouTube. I write for Entrepreneur Magazine. I write for Thrive Global, which is Ariana Huffington. You can find my podcast, of course, on iTunes, Dog Barons, Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. All those outlets. But, you know, simple way is this. I'm going to give you my, per my, my personal email. If you got something out of this show, I want to know what it is. Stephen put, takes the time, the energy, and the effort to bring you fabulous guests. And I know he's brought you amazing guests. Let him know, write to him, tell him what you got out of this. Don't make this a waste of time. Don't listen to this in the background. Take action. And then also write to Stephen. And make sure you go to his show, rate and review and subscribe to the show too. Keep yourself in that loop. And then write to me and tell me what you got out of this episode. My name is Dov, so it's D-O-V at D-O-V 
B-A-R-O-N.com. You can contact me directly if you're looking at me, uh, looking for somebody to help you who can coach you and mentor you into a higher level of leadership that is, in fact, purpose-driven. You can reach out to me through that. And if you just want to reach out to me and tell me what you got out of the show and how you're going to use it, I'm happy to have you communicate with me. Thank you, Steve, for having me on. It's been a pleasure and an honor, my friend. It's been, it's been, it's, 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 we'll have to do this again sometime. Give it another year or so. We'll catch up and do this again. Well, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, then it's Stephen at lawyersoftomorrow.com. Just put a PH in the Stephen, he'll get through to me. Uh, You can check out the website. We're planning to do a revamp of the website. It's underway at the moment. And the YouTube channel, well, this one's going to go up on the YouTube channel as well. So thank you very much. Yes, please do nip over to iTunes and do a nice review for uh, Lawyers of Tomorrow and give us a star rating. It really does help with developing the podcast. Dov, thank you so much. It's been great. Take care. Thank you, my friend. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, listeners. Thanks a lot.